Good afternoon, everyone. We are about to begin the second day of the conference, Institution Building, Governance and Compliance in Brazil, co-organized by the Columbia University and the New School. So welcome here to this university, so open for all kinds of controversies. You'll, you are about to learn that uh, this event uh, raised a lot of controversies. Um, and before we uh, come to our uh, schedule uh, for the agenda for the day, I will have some words from, the, some, from some NSSR, New School for Social Research faculty, who want to say a message to you. Thank you so much. So please give the, I give the floor for the professors. Uh, good morning and welcome to the new school. Uh, we've been asked uh, to read this letter on behalf of uh, a number of graduate students from the NSSR uh, because the organizers of the event denied us, uh, the new school members, uh, the opportunity of a short announcement uh, exhibiting its contents yesterday. And let me, this, this is all their statement, I'm reading their statement. It's addressed as follows. Open letter from members of the New School community regarding the event Institution Building Governance and Compliance in Brazil. We, the undersigned students, alumni, staff, and faculty members of the New School are writing to express our profound disapproval of this event, Institution Building, Governance and Compliance in Brazil, co-hosted by Columbia University and the New School on February 6th and 7th of 2017. The event remarkably embodies a one-sided set of views that is unrepresentative of and insensitive to the complexity of recent Brazilian politics. By uh, presenting uh, the car wash operation as paradigmatic of institution building governance and compliance in Brazil, the event implicitly embraces a narrative that contributed to the impeachment. Contrary to what is attempted by the events of the operation, of the car wash operation cannot be dissociated from the impeachment of the democratically elected president Dilma Rousseff in August 2016 and its consequences. President Rousseff's ousting, considered by many to be an institutional coup, remains a highly controversial and divisive issue and it has inaugurated a profound democratic crisis with no solution in sight. Furthermore, the event fails to address the subsequent rise to power of a government which has been systematically undermining civil and social rights and putting in place an unprecedented rigid austerity agenda whose members were cited in a plea bargains and are accused of trying to stop corruption investigations. This event uncritically and controversially invites protagonists from the ongoing democratic crisis in Brazil. Above all, the event naively assumes that representatives of the Brazilian judiciary embroiled in highly partisan di disputes are speaking from an uncontested and neutral perspective. Some of the speakers have been prominent agents in the selective prosecution of center-left politicians for corrupt practices that are actually widespread across the Brazilian political spectrum. For these reasons, members of the New School community raise these concerns to the event organizers, urging them to change the program to reflect the actual complexity of the situation. It was exhaustively emphasized that anyone familiar with recent events in Brazilian politics would be unable to ignore, in flagrant contrast to the purported scholarly neutrality and blatant partisanship of this event. With the support of members of the New School community and the New School sponsors of the event, we presented a number of requests to the organizers on the 3rd of February. Our most basic request was denied. The organizers emphatically rejected the possibility of adding a statement acknowledging that the topic is controversial and that not all the voices have been represented. This denial happened additionally and surprisingly in spite of the fact that similar concerns were brought to the organizers' attention from within Columbia University and elsewhere. Beyond the implications of misinforming an academic audience about the current political situation in Brazil, the structuring of this event diverges from important co core values embraced by the new school, such as the struggle for democracy and social justice, the need for critical thinking all the times, and the necessity of representative, even especially dissenting voices to be heard. Democracy is delicately at stake everywhere around the world, 
and our mission, especially in these tempestuous global political times, is to protect it in all places. Any attempt to undermine these values shall go unchallenged here. I now invite all of those that agree with this letter and felt silenced by this event to sit in peacefully uh, on the stage. Thank you. Thanks so much, professors. It's a pleasure to uh, open this kind of uh, discussions with such controversies and such a vibrant democracy happen here before our eyes. So let us just wait a minute. Okay, so it's my pleasure to call right now uh, pro Professor and Scholar Leonardo Petronilla, who will uh, present and introduce uh, the prosec Federal Prosecutor from Brazil, and to discuss the first part, we have an open dialogue with the Prosecutor, who is a member of the Kawash Operation Task Force, and then we'll proceed for the round table with our guests for the second part, of the discussion to finish uh, this wonderful event that happened these two days. And of course, uh, I would let, like to let you know that uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from Brazil was unable to attend due to several things that are happening in Brazil. But uh, we had invited uh, her to come as well. And in, for in, the, for last, uh, in the last minute, she uh, just let me know that she unfortunately will I uh, won't be here so with you Leonardo Petronilla thank you very much good afternoon I hope that we have like some space here I should sit after but so I just went first to introduce um, our guest. And it's good, like it's good that we have like these protests and this is very good for democracy and we can with this demonstrate tolerance, democracy and dialogue. This is very important. That's why this is the new school. So, So I want to invite the federal uh, public prosecutor who gained notoriety for joining the task force in car wash operation. His name is Paulo Roberto Galvão. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, students of the New School of Columbia University, and people from New York City who have uh, decided to attend this conference. I'd like to begin by thanking the organization of this event, uh, especially the institutions of the University of Columbia and the New School. Uh, I'd like to make a special mention to Mr. Leonardo Petronilla, Mr. Felipe Ramos, and Mr. Gustavo Azenha, who I believe have made this, uh, this event possible. It is an honor for me to be taking part of this conference and to talk about some of the perspectives of the car wash case and what it represents in terms of anti-corruption efforts and compliance practices in Brazil. Uh, let me start just giving you, I know that uh, a lot of you already know a lot about the operation, but. I'm sure that some people, uh, especially those who are not Brazilian, are not really aware of the size, the magnitude of this uh, criminal case. So I'll start by giving you a glimpse of the results that this investigation has reached so far 
in somewhere around three years of open investigations. Um, it is certainly the biggest corruption case ever brought to light in Brazil. We are not sure whether it's the uh, biggest corruption case that ever existed in Brazil, but we are glad that we are finally able to investigate and prosecute uh, corruption cases now. Uh, the numbers of this case are really outstanding. As of January, the case generated over 1,400 judicial proceedings of several kinds, 730 search warrants, 153 international assistance demands to and from 39 different countries, 73 plea agreements with individuals, and now we've just doubled that number to 150 uh, plea agreements with individuals, 56 separate prosecutions against 256 defendants from, for crimes of corruption, money laundering, financial crimes, and uh, the formation of criminal organizations. 125 people have already been convicted, totaling up to 1,317 years of jail time. Apart from that, on the side of restitution, restituting money to the Brazilian population, we have signed nine leniency agreements with companies. They have allowed for the restitution of $3.2 billion uh, to to, the, uh, to where it was taken from. Seven civil suits have been uh, managed, demanding so far a total of $12.2 billion amongst restitution, fines, and compensation. Uh, $242 million have been repatriated from abroad, from abroad, and we already have another billion dollars in assets frozen. This is also just a curiosity, the biggest uh, money laundering case uh, of foreign officials in the history of Switzerland as well. We have had in total $800 million in assets frozen in Switzerland. Uh, people tend to ask, with Brazil's records on impunity, how have these results on this case, how have they been achieved? Well, uh, Judge Moro explained yesterday a little bit about uh, how the case began. Uh, it began with an investigation of financial crimes and money laundering uh, that was made by way of the so-called doleiros, who are the Hawala dealers or foreign exchange black market money dealers. Uh, because there was a payment made to Mr. Paulo Roberto Costa, who was a former director of Petrobras, uh, we conducted searches and we found out that Mr. Costa was actually ordering the destruction of evidence and an arrest warrant was issued against Mr. Mr. Costa in a very justifiable, of course, uh, way since it was a matter of destructing evidence and obstructing justice. So on the first phase of this case, we call the phases when we uh, go out to uh, serve the, the search warrant and make the arrest. So on the first phase of this case alone, we already had a gigantic amount of evidence seized and obtained via banking records and communications intercepted. We, have, we had seized on the first phase alone 80,000 documents. Uh, all of this was really a scramble, a puzzle that we needed to clarify to understand what was on those documents. Why was a former director of Petrobras, he was not even a director anymore, he was a former director, why, why was he being paid by a doleiro, and who could the real payer be? Uh, now, what happens with these doleiros, these foreign exchange black market dealers, is that they receive money from several sources and they send money to several uh, sources. These are not only companies willing to launder bribery or officials willing to launder bribery money, companies willing to send money abroad, just different people, individuals willing to send money abroad, uh, hiding them from, uh, from the authorities. Uh, this person alone, there's one uh, figure on the car wash case alone. At one time when he, was, he had big operations, he managed $40 million a day in illegal transactions, illegal financial transactions. So when you see all that evidence and you try to make sense of that, uh, you just cannot. So you cannot, we usually talk about the follow the money approach. In fact, in such a case, we cannot just follow the money because the money come from, comes from 
uh, different places and goes to different places. And what is interesting, uh, they have so much money circulating around that they don't need actually to transfer money from one country to the other. Uh, so they have the, the money that they have in Brazil and the money that they have in, for example, Switzerland, they will make compensations and the actual money will not go through. So it makes it impossible to just look at the numbers and, and understand what is going on. That is also one of the reasons why the investigation of corruption and money laundering is so difficult. Um, what happened on this case, and this became a crucial, uh, very important moment to the case, was that Mr. Costa and Mr. Youssef de Doleiro, they decided to enter into plea agreements uh, cooperation agreements with the prosecution service. Now, uh, in this country, uh, it is possible to do plea bargains, guilty pleas, where you just, um, you just plead guilty and you have a penalty that is compatible or even a minor penalty, and that's it. But in our country, our system uh, that has been put up uh, in recent times, it, it demands, and we have demanded, that each one of the cooperating defendants, uh, not only does he have to plead guilty, but he has to bring to the prosecution, to the investigation, new evidence. That could be new evidence of crimes that he committed and we are not aware, but especially evidence of new people involved in these crimes uh, and new ways to find the money that was stolen from the Brazilian population. So, uh, so these were the first two uh, relevant cooperating defendants, and right now we have 73, and doubling the number now to 150 cooperating defendants. So that, uh, that allows you to understand why this investigation has expanded with such uh, speed, strength, and with uh, such quality of evidence. The evidence that these people are able to uh, point us towards them is really important and uh, of a high probatory uh, quality to, to bring cases. We like to say that this has created a real domino effect where one card uh, takes down the other and they all in the end will, uh, they all in the end uh, finally decide to also enter into plea agreements because they understand the strength of the evidence that has been collected against these people that are being investigated. Now, the information that Mr. Costa uh, brought to us revealed to the authorities something that was really new. Uh, it led us to collect the evidence of a major scheme of corruption and money laundering involving Petrobras, by then it was Brazil's biggest company, uh, a state state-owned oil company, uh, and which was building construction projects worth billions of dollars. Uh, on, a, on a regular picture, we would see that Petrobras would hire construction companies in a bidding process, and these companies naturally would sub-hire to uh, other smaller companies a part of the services. Um, the directors of Petrobras, this is quite common and regular in Brazil, they tend to be appointed by politicians, by political parties, parties that form uh, the coalition of the government. This is considered legal, regular, although it, it seems very unwise from a perspective of governance and management. But that's not the problem. The problem is that on top of that structure, that payment structure, uh, the real picture that we found out is really different. On the one side, 16 of the major construction companies in Brazil formed a cartel where they would allocate future projects of Petrobras amongst themselves and to win the bids they would refrain from bidding or place cover bids so as to let the previously elected company win the bidding. Uh, of course they would, doing that they would uh, hire their, their numbers, their prices or they would not go into, need to go into competition with each other. And but for that system to work, they needed the directors of Petrobras to at least, at least to turn their eyes away from the cartel, uh, if not to take some specific acts to benefit these companies on the contracts. Now, on the other side, 
political parties who appointed the directors needed them to collect money for the party, for the parties in the coalition and for their, their members to be used both for political campaigns but also in the relevant parts for personal purposes. Directors, on their part, they were interested in keeping their positions and in profiting from this scheme. All of these interests, interests the, uh, the directors, the politicians, the companies, they came smoothly together and a system was put in place where between one and three percent of bribes on every contract had to be paid by the companies hired. The amount depended actually on which sector of the uh, company was involved. For one branch, we saw that 1% of the contract was due. For another branch, it was 2%. And recently, we even found a branch of the company where the uh, bribery fee was 5.5%. Now, to transfer the corruption money without leaving traces, several different schemes were used. The first was through front companies. Especially consulting companies would charge a fee and then pass the money on forward either in cash or outside of the country via the leaders uh, to offshore companies and other means of uh, transferring money. Some companies even had their own special structures uh, put in place only to provide illegal money to uh, public officers and intermediaries all, along, all over the, the world. Uh, Part of the this is quite uh, interesting. Part of the money that was a part, for example, of that one to three percent, was also paid directly to the political parties by way of official campaign contributions that were later on deducted from the percentage of the bribes that had to be paid. Uh, especially on the international board of Petrobras, but also on some of the other boards, companies from outside of this cartel of 16, which I just mentioned also profited from, profited from this scheme. Uh, we can now say that we are investigating over 30 companies and 30 big major construction companies, and several of them are indeed international companies. Not only Brazilian companies are being investigated on this scheme. Now, after uh, a lot of evidence was gathered, uh, some more plea agreements, what we initially thought was eight million dollars that we saw going from Mr. Youssef to Doledo to Mr. Costa, the director of Petrobras, this turned out to be a corruption case of 2.1 billion dollars only in Petrobras. This is actually the amount of money that Petrobras has written off on their records, on their annual balance. They have recognized, acknowledged that this is the amount of bribes that Petrobras in the end ended up paying, uh, leaving the, the, the the sheets of Petrobras to others. But this is just to cover corruption expenses. $2.1 billion is just to cover corruption expenses. Of course, if a company uh, corrupts, she's looking to get some more gains out of that. So we have some estimates that uh, looking into the functioning of the cartel, the cartel would always uh, put its prices higher than the, the, it should be on the market. We have estimates that range the damage to Petrobras somewhere from $9 billion to $13 billion. Uh, these estimations were made by the federal police and by the federal audit courts. Now, another very interesting point, the breakdown of the bribery money uh, would follow roughly a division like this. This is the division uh, I'm referring to specifically to the downstream area. This is where we get, we have more information from. Uh, so, out of all of the corruption money, 20% would be used to uh, expenses with the money laundering process. So, for example, these consultancy companies that were uh, hired to transfer money, uh, pass money on for us, they would actually pay taxes uh, because they were they were they had they had uh, fake service contracts, but they they needed to look real, so they would pay taxes on top of those contracts. So 20% would be used to cover these expenses. 6% would be handled by the money laundering professional, in this case, Mr. Youssef. 60% of the bribe money would go to the political parties and the politicians outside of Petrobras who were responsible for uh, maintaining the director and the, uh, 
the people of the party in the company. So they were actually the main benefiters of the corruption money. The director of Petrobras himself would only keep 14% of the bribe money. So it just seems that the, this shows that the director of Petrobras was actually a small piece in a much larger scheme that was put together by businessmen alongside with uh, politicians and the directors of Petrobras, uh, evidently, to uh, create this scheme, which there's no, there's no doubt we can, we can say this is a scheme put up by politicians and political parties in an upper level of decision making above the directors of Petrobras. What evidence has also shown us is that each political party that formed the coalition of the government, actually the main political parties that formed the coalition, they owned one of the areas of Petrobras uh, by way of indicating its director. So we have one area of Petrobras that was to one party, the other was to another party, the third to a third party. And when they had the power to uh, assign, to, uh, to indicate the uh, director, they sort of had that, that area, that sector of the company to do sort of, at, let's say, as they pleased in terms of collecting uh, bribes. And what, with the advancement of the investigations, what we have seen is that the same sort of scheme existed not only in Petrobras, but in other uh, major agencies, public companies, sectors of the government uh, that could be sort of divided up between the parties in the, uh, in the coalition. To, and it, the same thing existed. We have already uncovered very similar schemes in Electronuclear, which is the nuclear energy state company, some state-owned banks, uh, infrastructure agencies, and even the planning ministry. And uh, every, every time, every day, we are gathering more evidence of this same sort of thing happening in other branches of, uh, in other areas of the governance. Now, all of this is certainly very new to the Brazilian scenario, not in terms of the corruption, but in terms of exposing the corruption. Uh, as I just said, I couldn't say that corruption schemes such as this is really new because we are unaware of previous schemes could even be bigger than this, or there might be schemes on the local or state governments that could be as sophisticated. Uh, unfortunately, we, as, as uh, state agents that have to investigate these crimes, we are usually, on our day-to-day -day basis, we are unable to investigate this, this type of crimes. But the truth is this, for the first time, an investigation has reached really so deep on the guts of political organizations that use governmental resources to criminally finance themselves and their members. Given that, it is, of course, natural that a whole set of criticisms arise, even as a reaction to the advancement of the investigations. Since it is actually nowadays, it's almost impossible to dispute the overwhelming evidence that we have put together, what we see are uh, defense tactics tactics that usually are attempts to undermine the credibility of the whole investigation uh, by repeating untrue criticisms that are sometimes even uh, have been stated in paid advertisements in the media. Of course, we are not uh, free from criticism, but I'd like, just like to take a few of the criticisms to show you with numbers uh, why we believe they are untrue. Now, one very common argument is, that is made is that an excessive number of detentions have occurred in order to force detainees to enter into plea agreements, and that would be the reason why we have so many plea agreements. Now, just let's take a look at the numbers, and we can easily realize that this is a false criticism. In total, the case has generated, in all of its now 37 uh, phases where we go out and uh, serve the warrants, the case has generated 100 provisional arrests, but in fact, 103 of these this provisional arrests were what we call temporary arrests, the last from two to 10 days maximum. Uh, now, we have already charged 260 people. I'm certain that we don't have the number, but more than 1,000 people are investigated. If we take different pictures 
of the case in different moments, we usually come to the, num to the, the following percentage. Only 8% of the people accused, not even the investigated, 8% of the people charged are actually detained at each one time. So right now, we have, on the whole, on this gigantic case, we have only 21 people detained on the car wash case. Out of these 21 people that, have, that are detained right now, 12 of them have already been trialed. So we only have now nine people in pre-trial detention, but they have already been charged. Uh, these percentages are not isolated. We see them all the time. Another, another interesting number is that out of the 73 initial cooperating defendants and now 150, and 50, in fact, uh, over 80% of these people were not detained when they entered into plea agreements and actually had never been detained on the car wash case. Uh, less than 20%, around 15 or even less uh, of the people who entered into plea agreements were actually detained. This shows that detention is not the main cause for them to enter into plea agreements. Uh, we believe that the main cause for someone to come to us as a strategy of defense and tell us that they want to confess and they want to bring new evidence is that they finally become aware of the strength of the evidence that has been collected against them. This is actually, uh, I could say this is healthy when this works in a system where the defense is able to uh, analyze the evidence and realize that there is so much evidence that the best thing can do for their clients is to come and enter into plea agreements. Um, we also saw, we, also, we can also see today that a great, great number of these people uh, who have shouted criticism on the press, saying that this number, this operation is a fantasy and we create evidence, uh, sometimes even on live appearances on TV showings. Uh, some of these people are now confessing to their crimes and are giving public apologies on the same press. Uh, apologies to the Brazilian population, not to the investigators. Uh, they don't always apologize, but apologies to the Brazilian population for what they have done. Uh, it is also said that the judge presiding over the trials, Mr. Moro, could be unfair to the defense. Now, uh, Brazil is probably the country where the defense has the most possibilities to appeal. We have a system where minor issues can go up to the Supreme Court in uh, three levels of decision above the, the federal judge on the ground. Uh, but even if we check with this uh, thousands of possibilities of appeal, if we look at the numbers from the high courts, uh, we also reach the conclusion that uh, the judges, in fact, has been, uh, his decisions have been pretty much almost all the time correct. We have a percentage of over 95% of decisions by Mr. Moro that are maintained by the courts. Uh, for instance, 512 habeas corpus and appeals on habeas corpus have been filed on the car wash case. Only 4.2% of these habeas corpus uh, caused an overruling on Judge Moro's decisions. And since in Brazil, habeas corpus does not refer only to detention, it can be used to any procedural matter. Uh, you, can, you can file a habeas corpus. So in fact, some of these, uh, most of these 4.2% that have been, uh, that have caused an overruling of Judge Moro's decision, refer to minor issues and not exactly, for example, an arrest. Uh, there is also, of course, a criticism that tends to be con constantly repeated and is the one about political bias, uh, given that the major part of the people that are investigated are linked to a few political parties. Now, there is a very simple explanation to that. Uh, this is a federal investigation. Uh, I am a federal prosecutor. We are work with the federal police, the federal revenue service, and the federal judge to investigate federal crimes in Brazil, federal crimes, they have to be uh, somewhat related to federal money uh, on the area of corruption. So we have had in this country a coalition of parties leading the federal government for 14 years. So it's only natural that if we are, if we are investigating a federal crime, we're looking into the parties that 
uh, controlled the federal government. It does not make a lot of sense, would not make a lot of sense, for example, for money to be channeled from Petrobras, a federal company that was governed by one coalition, that this coalition would allow this money to go to an opposition party. Now, this does not mean, I would like to repeat once again, this does not mean that we say there is no corruption elsewhere. In fact, we would really like to be able to investigate and, uh, and punish corruption elsewhere. Uh, now, on this stage of the investigation, after three years, we have come to a point where finally we are being able, because of the strength of the evidence, the amount of evidence that we have, we are finally being able to, uh, when a company comes to us and wants, for example, to enter into a leniency agreement, we are finally able to tell the company, we want evidence not only of what you know here, but we want more of what you can give us that would allow investigations elsewhere in the country to flourish. Uh, and we are at this stage right now where we are finally able to look into uh, matters from outside of the federal government, from state governments, from local municipalities. Uh, of course, we still need to wait for the Supreme Court to decide who is going to trial these cases. It's probably, given the, the former decisions from the Supreme Court, it's very likely that these cases will not be kept with the uh, test force of the car wash case will not be trialed by Mr. Moro, but that's because uh, the Supreme Court uh, might decide so. But our goal is that uh, prosecutors and judges on the state level as well and anywhere in Brazil, our goal is that they have the same capacity to uh, investigate, prosecute, and trial these cases as we did in the car wash case. Um, Now, we have unveiled corruption worth $2.1 billion in Petrobras. We are not even close to finding out uh, other most corruption schemes in the country. This might even be the biggest, but I'm sure there is several other corruption schemes everywhere. The United Nations estimates corruption in Brazil to cause damages of up to $60 billion a year. Just to help us see the damaging effects of corruption to society. The money that is taken from corruption could be used, $60 billion, to generate great benefits to the population. It could triple the federal budget on education. It could triple the federal budget on health. It is equivalent to five times all the public investments, federal, state, and local in public safety in a year. Now, the case is indeed big. But we, uh, I speak for myself, but I, I share the opinion of a lot of members, a lot of the members of the uh, task force. We are, uh, people tend to say that uh, car wash case is a groundbreaking case. Uh, it's gonna turn the page in Brazil. We do not believe that. Uh, we are actually very much aware that the case itself is not going to bring big change to the corruption scenario in Brazil. Uh, I believe the case is now consolidated. There, it is very difficult to, for the case to go back, to retrocede. Uh, however, even if we finalize this case with success, which I think we will do, uh, we will have only shown to the population and punished one scheme of corruption existing in the country, while there are several others. So what we need, in fact, is uh, some other changes apart from the case that could help us do that, could, would, could help us expose other corruption schemes and finally prevent other corruption schemes from coming about. Uh, so even if this case alone is not going to do it by itself, this is the case that brings the real opportunity for these changes to happen. Why? Because the population is right now pretty much aware of the problem of corruption. Uh, a poll last year showed that for the Brazilian population, the number one problem is now corruption. And of course, corruption because people understand now that corruption is a problem that causes other problems to the country. Uh, with all of this in mind, the 
Prosecution Service launched, presented to society in 2015, a set of 10 legislative proposals to improve the fight against corruption. Uh, these proposals were mainly focused on three pillars, preventive measures, recovering assets, and diminishing the levels of impunity that mark white collar crimes and crimes related to politicians in Brazil, with the goal to make corruption more risky to these people, uh, and with the goal to reduce the levels of impunity. What happens is, until the car wash case, uh, corruption was a crime that presented virtually no risk to these people, so we need to make corruption more risky. Uh, these proposals are based on several studies that have sustained the success of such measures in other countries uh, and that have explained the reasonings, the rationale, the reasonings that move corrupt practices. Uh, these are based, including on experience of American professors, Professor Robert Clickard from Claremont and Professor Rose Ackerman from Yale. Now, the importance of this campaign goes beyond the actual contents of the bills of law that it proposed. Uh, the way that society, not only us, but the uh, campaign leaders envisaged, envisaged putting this forward was by way of a people's bill of law, popular initiative bill of law, a legislation that would start as a proposal from the population and presented to Congress. Uh, we collected signatures of more than 1% of our electorate, so more than 2,200,000 people signed these proposals. However, as most of you will know, uh, these proposals were initially welcomed by Congress and they were analyzed by a special committee. The special committee heard over 100 specialists and they were approved by the special committee on its, most of its parts. Uh, however, on a very sad day for the country, the proposals were smashed overnight at the end of the year. And uh, however, we truly believe that th this defeat does not mean that we, as society, that we should not keep up with our efforts. Uh, most gladly, society has really engaged very heavily on this campaign. Uh, people were talking about it on the streets. Many feel that they are now a relevant part of the anti-corruption efforts in this moment in the country. So we have a lot of uh, small benefits coming out of this. One of them, for example, uh, we still expect the bills to pass, but we have been able to propagate a culture against corrupt practices in Brazil. So I like to believe I, I don't have the means to, uh, to verify whether this is true or not, but I like to believe that these people, over 200, over 2 million, 200 people that signed the petitions, and of course all the others who supported even though they didn't get a chance to sign, uh, once they are involved in a movement against corruption, they, they will look into themselves from an ethical perspective, and they will possibly uh, change the way they see corruption. So whereas you had people uh, that would feel uh, it was normal to bribe a police officer out of a ticket, uh, I believe that these people that went into this campaign, they will probably think twice before they do something like that again. And this is very important in a country where minor corruption uh, really tends to be culturally accepted. There is much more to be done. As Judge Morrow said yesterday, efforts must not be concentrated on police investigations and prosecution. Uh, we need much more, and much more can be done to uh, tackle corruption in the country. We are aware that we need reforms in our political systems. Uh, the high cost of the campaigns in Brazil, the excessive number of political parties and candidates are actually, they work as incentives to this level of systemic corruption that we have seen on the car wash case. We also need changes in the prerogative that high-ranked officers have that prevents them from being investigated and trialed before a single judge, what we call privilégio de foro, foro privilegiado. Uh, we have members on our Supreme Court that are extremely qualified and highly committed to defending public interest. But however, so our Supreme Court handles over 10,000 cases a year. The U.S. Supreme Court, for example, handles, I believe, 100 cases a year. 
to use the words of Judge Barroso from the Supreme Court himself, uh, a system like this cannot work. Of course, this is all very controversial, and Congress tends to go against any proposals for reform in this area. However, I, I believe that uh, a proposal coming from someone with legitimacy to, to propose something like this, for example, a proposal coming from the Supreme Court itself would have a lot of popular support, and Congress would have to look into that. Now, just to conclude, uh, so despite all of the, the fuss that this case has generated, uh, I and other members of the task force, we really believe that we have not yet crossed the bridge on corruption, uh, anti-corruption efforts in Brazil. If we stop now, the case might, might even uh, be a success, but we, are not, we will not have uh, reached the place where we could go. Uh, this is to say that society really needs to maintain aware, awareness, uh, especially to keep moving forward, but also to avoid setbacks on the anti-corruption efforts. Uh, it is important with or even after the car wash case that this topic of corruption stays in the mind of society so that uh, no setbacks may come and we may advance forward. Now, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to speak, and I'll be available to explain more and the questions to follow. Hello. It was a little bit difficult to get inside here, but you know, New York is always better together, especially in the winter. So, Paulo, I have some questions for you, and after we're going to open for everybody to raise questions, even like everybody. And we have an open microphone as yesterday. We did, and so I brought some questions I, that I hope that I think it's better to, to read. Much controversy hovers over the plea bargain based on the act passed by the former president, Rousseff, administration. administration. The car wash operation swiftly took advantage of it and was able to bring to the table the, man, the main businessmen and CEOs of construction companies, brokers, lobbyists, leading politicians, and former directors of state-run company Petrobras. Since the plea deals are subject to much subjectivity, like the prosecutor's calculations of the worth of the information obtained, could you explain how do this process really work? How do you and your team decide to lower the numbers of the years in jail for the defendant? How do you, uh, how, uh, I know you have established guidelines and procedures for this matter, but how to avoid arbitrary uh, arbitrariness in order to ensure that everything is done strictly in a, te in a technical way. So I'm saying like basically I want to know what is the criteria for like this uh, plea bargain. All right, Laurent, thank you for the question. Uh, quite a relevant one uh, indeed. Um, so let me begin from earlier 90, 1990s and 2000. That's where uh, plea agreements started for the first time to appear in Brazil on the Banastado case. There was no, uh, there, was a, there was less legislation regarding that, and we started to gain experience on, in doing these things. 
It's interesting that some of the prosecutors that worked on that case that made the first cooperation agreements in Brazil are still are now on the car wash case again. Um, whereas in the U.S., this is something that happens for ages. That thing started in Brazil late 90s, the beginning of the year 2000s, and it actually stopped for a while, only to be picked up again. This is strategy now in the car wash case. So there is no uh, there is no set of precedents. There is no set of guidelines as, as there are here in the U.S. And we need to be very careful when doing something like that because we really need to avoid, uh, we need to put the public interest in first place and we need to avoid uh, eventually committing an injustice or an injustice, an injustice can go through both sides. So it might be unjust for someone to stay in jail more time than they should, but it was also unjust for someone to stay in jail less time than they should. Now, when we look into the, the plea agreements, we have to understand, as I said, that this is what made the operation uh, explain, expand. Uh, so we, we have to look into a set of uh, several criteria to understand first whether we need, it's not a matter of want, it's a matter of need, whether we need that uh, material that that person is bringing us. So we need to look whether uh, the information is new, whether we could have gotten that information through other means, uh, the quality, quality of the evidence, um, whether, we, uh, whether what the person says can be also proved by evidence that she's bringing, that we, we should not rely only on the deposition, on the testimony of that person. So this is a set of criteria that will help us understand whether we want we need that evidence, so we need the agreement. After we realized we needed the agreement, uh, we, we move back and we look into what we can ask for that person in order to receive that uh, evidence. And this is a negotiation. There is no other explanation. This is a negotiation. Uh, if we are, are in a position where we need the evidence and the person is in a position where, for example, that person uh, was not being prosecuted, uh, we hadn't yet gotten to that person, that will make uh, jail time, the, the sentence for that person will be slower, be lower. Now, if it's someone uh, with whom, uh, against whom we already had a lot of evidence, uh, their position is, is uh, less strong and we will be able to adjust those, uh, those penalties on a higher level. Now, we really don't have a guideline such as they have here in the U.S., but what we have is an evolving uh, experience that has been created even inside of the car wash case where we can look also into previous cases, the first cases, and you can see that uh, the, the newer the uh, plea agreements, the higher the penalty will be. Why? Because we are in stage of the investigation where we don't really uh, need to gather much more evidence. So we have people now coming to us and there's people that will tell us, look, I can stay five years in jail. And we say, but what you are telling me, I already know, so it doesn't interest me. Thank you. Sure. I have another one. Sure. The car wash operation has uncovered a large scheme of graft and money laundering. This leads directly to the international dimension of the operation, since the money stolen from state's coffers are laundered in tax havens and offshores. How has this international cooperation been undertaken? How did you succeed or not to cooperate with countries like Panama, Switzerland, and other small countries whose economies depend on the revenues of overseas corruption? All right, it's a great question as well. Um, so in the car wash case, we have cooperation now with 39 different countries. Um, it's, it's also alongside with the uh, plea agreements, this is also one of the pillars of the success of the investigation. Uh, the possibility that we have had to gain contact 
and gain access to evidence from all of these countries. Uh, so this is also, on the one side, this is a result of the uh, strengthening of the institutions in Brazil. So nowadays, the public prosecution service of Brazil is respected anywhere in the world as a, an institution that can be trusted. So if we knock on whichever country's door and say we are the public prosecution service of Brazil, the federal public prosecution service, uh, we are respected and we can get evidence from that country. Uh, but it's very interesting that we also... Um, it's just like, it's just one way or you... you no, it's not just one way. And uh, on the beginning, it was one way. We were looking into uh, the other countries where we know, knew that there could be offshore accounts, where some of the people leave, where we needed some evidence. And we were uh, crazy looking for evidence. We needed evidence. Nowadays, it's actually mostly the other way around. Uh, we have already had, uh, I might be mistaken, but I think 17 countries have already asked us for help on their investigations that uh, come from the car wash case. So investigations have been started in several different countries elsewhere, and we are helping these countries. Now, you mentioned Panama, Switzerland, and other countries. The truth is, uh, uh, another which reason one, for... Which one is, is the uh, more like, <laughs> difficult to... I'll tell you. To uh, another reason for this investigation to have been successful now uh, is because nowadays Switzerland has a policy where it really cooperates with, uh, with third world countries on, on corruption issues and on money laundering there. Uh, if we had done this, I don't know, in the 90s, uh, it was said that Switzerland did not cooperate. And that's probably why a lot of the money was still being kept in Switzerland, because people believed that Switzerland would not cooperate. Um, Switzerland and has been probably the most helpful country of them all. The U.S. has been really helpful with their, uh, they have a legislation here where uh, it's a very strong legislation and contrarily to Brazil, here when a company is involved in corruption, it will, instead of fighting, arguing, disputing the investigation, it will do the opposite. It will just open up all, all their books, all their email accounts and tell the authorities, look, you are free to come in here and look at everything you want. So uh, the U.S. has also helped us with this strength of their legislation. The fact that we have said, look, uh, the U.S. is also looking into this, has made companies uh, look twice, think twice. And we have countries like, for example, you mentioned Panama. Panama was a country that we had a hard time with the cooperation with Panama. However, uh, we are very gladly cooperating. We are cooperating with Panama now. Another question. We are aware that whenever there is a large scale process of any sort such as the car wash operation with so many actors involved, it is unlikely to control and coordinate the actions of all individuals. Anyway, we have witnessed too many leaks in the course of the investigations. Some would say that the amount of leaks goes beyond the reasonable. These leaks endanger the secrecy that is both a right of the defendant and the necessary requirement to provide legitimacy of the overall probe. Questions. Why so many leaks? How are you working to improve this issue within the operation? Because we always like face and especially in the news, like these leaks. Leonardo, I wish I had a very good answer for that, but I don't. I don't know. Uh, but I can do some explanation that might help uh, people understand why I don't know, why we don't know. Uh, so first thing, first explanation, general explanation I should make is that a lot of what is seen as leaks are not actually leaks. Uh, the trial in Brazil is public. And we have, uh, this is 
unique of the south of Brazil, there is an electron, electronic filing system that is open to the public. So whereas, in, for example, if you go to Brazil, you need to go to the courts and open up the pages of the file to look into that. In the south of Brazil, you just need to go online. And since the files are public, anyone can go online and the press can go online. So what happens with a lot of the things that are mentioned as leaks that are not leaks is that since the case is public, uh, for example, you have a deposition in the afternoon on one of the cases, and in the evening that thing is playing on national news. That's not a leak. That's just because the, uh, the press went to, and anyone could have done that, went to the file and downloaded the, uh, the image of the deposition. So that's not a leak. Now, that doesn't mean there are no leaks. There are actually a lot of leaks, much more than acceptable. And uh, we have to understand the leaks are very rarely they will be good for the investigation. They are very harmful for the investigation. And we can only guess why so many leaks happen. It's interesting that a, a big part of the leaks uh, are not actually leaks. They are suppositions or even lies. For example, there is this one figure, one executive of one of the uh, main enterprises in Brazil that since 2014, this guy has been maybe on five uh, covers of national magazines uh, saying what he was about to reveal on his plea agreement. However, three years later, we don't even have a plea agreement with this person, and he has been on five covers of, uh, of national magazines. So uh, we can only guess, and I don't want to make, I don't want to make, let's say, unfair guesses, but we have some possibilities. One possibility is that uh, whenever we are negotiating an agreement and we tend not to accept that agreement, uh, there might be a strategy that the person will leak whatever they would have to say to the press, so that the press may come and say, how can you not want this agreement? Do you want to protect this person that this guy would reveal? So this is one possibility. Uh, another possibility is just that this sort of information, they go through so many people that it's really impossible to control. So in Brazil, uh, you cannot hide evidence from the defense. And even when the case is, is concealed, that there's a secrecy. Uh, defense has access to it. And not only the one defense, but the defense of each other that are being investigated on the same case. So you have many possibilities for, for leaks to arise. And other than that, this is a case where uh, there is a lot of media exposure. It's not a regular case going on. Uh, it's, I don't know, think of the O.J. Simpson case here in the U.S. The press is there all the time, and they know who is coming in the building, who is going outside of the building. It's really hard to control. So now the microphone it's open. So, yeah, you can go. Okay. Oh, there is a line. There is a line. I was paying attention. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one minute, one minute, or one, one and a half. Okay, I'll try it. <laughs> um, it's going to be almost the same question I did to Sergio Moro yesterday. I'm a politician, and first of all, let me say that I approve and support everything uh, the public ministry and the uh, federal justice are doing with the car wash uh, investigation. But I, I'm a politician. I, I'm the former mayor of Pelotas in Rio Grande do Sul. And I'm very concerned about how things are going in, in Brazil when we are discussing, f uh, for example, the, the proposal, the, the law proposal uh, that you mentioned uh, last year, because it's beginning to get very hard to govern. Uh, it's not, politicians are not being prosecuted only for crimes. Here in, in Carwash, we're talking about crimes. But any fault or uh, any merit uh, uh, decision can be uh, sued, can, can, can go to justice. And the dishonesty, uh, uh, administri administrative, sorry, administrative dishonesty, improbidade uh, administrativa, the law is from 1992 
at the moment with the impeachment of President Kohler. And I'm very afraid of changing laws about it uh, in the middle of this crisis because maybe we're not going to the right way. Uh, and f to finish my speech Thank and, and question you. here, uh, um, when the Congress did the, gave the wrong answer to it, talking about uh, dishonesty for prosecutors and judges, and I agree, it was the wrong answer, uh, but w the, the, the answer of the judges and prosecutors was correctly, they don't have to be afraid of judging and prosecuting to do their job, uh, but who's governing doesn't have to be afraid of governing, and we are afraid of governing, so there are honest people, honest people that are leaving politics for it, so this is uh, my concern. And how can we conciliate things uh, to work better together and deliver better results to our citizens? Thank you. All right, um, I understand the question, certainly. Uh, let, me, let me just begin by uh, just pointing out that what you're mentioning has nothing to do with the car wash investigation because we are not looking into uh, doubtful cases. Our cases, we have plenty of evidence, there is no doubt there. Um, I, I, I could agree theoretically, I can agree with you. Uh, I know of cases where uh, there has been too much uh, overseen of the government by the local prosecutors and the, uh, and the local judges, and so that people understand here, uh, so the, the public prosecution service in Brazil, it carries other functions other than criminal prosecution and investigation. So we not only investigate crime, but we sort of like oversee the use of public resources. And there tends to be a, uh, an attempt to overreach uh, these, these attributions, uh, especially on, on local municipalities. However, we also tend to have on the other side uh, uh, politicians that are exceeding its powers. And it, it's, this is a very difficult, it's very difficult to balance, to find the, the right balance for these, these two issues. Uh, I understand your concerns. Let me say that on the, on the 10 proposals against corruption, there was one proposal relating to this sort of issue that you were referring, but it was not actually, uh, it would not change that situation even not for better, not for worse. It was a matter of, uh, making the cases run faster, uh, not, not making them stronger or weaker in terms of uh, what the prosecutors are doing. But I, I understand your concerns and I think there, a lot of times there might be a need to, uh, a contempt of the uh, powers of the prosecutors in that sense. Hi, good afternoon. Um, well, just, I just wanna start with a quick note. Uh, that perhaps tells a lot about this event and democracy in Brazil and your presence here. Um, the way you present the 10 measures against corruption, it makes it sound like an initiative of popular demand, like something that came from the people, it is a consensus. And the reality is far from that. Uh, I agree with some of these measures and disagree, but there, there lacks a lot of uh, consultation from civil society. Uh, so this is far from being a consensual 10 measures. And by the way, they've far more than 10 measures. So there has to be popular debate on that. So that, that's just uh, an initial note. Uh, the question I wanted to, to make is, last December, the, the Center for Studies for, of Public Safety at Kanjido Mendes University published an independent evaluation of the federal ministry, the federal public ministry where you work. Uh, the extensive reports that was widely uh, publicized in Brazil depicts the public ministry as an elitist and biased institution. According to the study, the vast majority of public prosecutors serving at the ministry are white men from privileged backgrounds. Uh, the report also suggests the little familiarity uh, that these officers have with the reality of most Brazilians is what in part explains the unbalanced priorities of the, uh, ministry, uh, of, the, of the ministry. The report shows that most of the work of the ministry is focused exactly on corruption combat, uh, which is not necessarily bad, whereas other areas of public interest, such as public education, health, environment, labor, human rights, especially, and criminal rights, uh, are largely unattended. 
what do you think of this report? And do you think the federal public ministry treats rich Brazilians the same way as it treats poor and unattended one? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't need to comment the 10 proposals. It was just a comment, right? Or do you need an answer? No, no. All right. So I'll, I'll stick to the other one because it's, uh, it's more uh, interesting to answer. Um, so there was this study. I, I'm aware of it. Uh, I believe there is a bit of bias in this study, but not on the part that probably you mentioned. Uh, I have to say that it is true that uh, prosecutors in Brazil do come from uh, one, uh, one uh, status of society, let's, say, let's put it like that, uh, and are usually white men, but that's not, that's not a privilege of the prosecutors. That's what happens in Brazil in any profession that you look that is a, uh, a graduation profession. So if you look in the doctors, it's going to be the same profile. If you look in the engineers, it's going to be the same profile. If you look at the students here, it's going to be the same profile. So that's not a privilege of the prosecutors. That's how our society, unfortunately, works. Uh, we come from the same society. Now, that doesn't mean that given we, as you guys do, as the students here do, come from the same uh, part of society, that doesn't mean that we only look to this part of society. And in fact, uh, your, your, I think the way you put it also reveals that there is a uh, the twist there. Uh, on the one hand, do we, are we looking into corruption or are we treating white men with privileges? Uh, I, I believe that one thing goes against the other. Uh, we are actually, our will is to go against corruption, but because we believe that corruption is made by uh, white powerful men, usually, and the ones that suffer from corruption are the lower classes of society. So when we fight corruption, we are also looking, on my point of view, we are also looking into defending the human rights of most of the population in Brazil. Now, the one part that I think is biased is where it says, also says that we are uh, placing a, uh, we are underlooking the other areas where we should act. Uh, we are not. There is a lot of work being done on the prosecution service in the federal and local levels, and even uh, the, the person just before you, when he mentioned what happens in the local municipalities, this also has to do with, not corruption, but uh, prosecutors actually uh, looking into every single uh, act of the administration, on local administration, and trying to uh, maybe uh, act, wanting to act a lot in that area as well. So that's, that's just the part. What about police supervision, too? There's one. Uh, but, uh, um, police one supervision? Specific, yeah, police, oversight of police. Brazilian police is notorious for killing, uh, for being one of the most murderous police uh, yeah. in the world. So. Oversight civilian. Yeah, all right. That's so, the role of the ministry. Yeah, that is, that is a role of the ministry. Um, that is mostly, mostly a role of state police. Uh, public prosecution services, not the federal public prosecution service, mostly, uh, uh, usually. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that there is right now, there is even a debate in Brazil because the federal prosecution service tried to uh, look into what, what was happening, I think in Sao Paulo, I'm not sure, and there was a debate whether they could or they could not do that. Uh, there is, we have just recently on the federal prosecution service, just recently, we have created a special area uh, what we call the control stern, which is the, the outside control of the, uh, of the police. And we are trying to advance on that area as well. But I believe that's a very important area to look into. Uh, be aware of that. Thank you. I don't know. Can I switch a little bit? Then? Okay. No, do you want first? Okay. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Sergio Trindadi. I am a global consultant on sustainable business. I've been living in New York for decades now. I was a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and I'm very pleased to be here, and I thank uh, the New School for the invitation. I would also uh, like to uh, congratulate the students who were here a moment ago for their presence uh, and, uh, in this uh, event. I would have liked if they would have one of them uh, sitting 
among you and being able to express uh, their, their viewpoint, their point of, this, of discord. But uh, <clears throat> my point here is that uh, corruption, unfortunately, in Brazil is embedded in the culture. In fact, it started, the evidence started in the first document of Brazil's history when the scribe of the fleet, Cabral's fleet, wrote to his king uh, about the new discovery and at the end of the letter asked for a job for his nephew. I don't know if the job was granted or not, but uh, it shows that favoritism and things like that are part of the culture. Uh, the thing is, uh, what really makes it difficult for change to happen in Brazil, and this is why it is so important that, that the uh, 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 Lava Jato operation is, is at work, is something called impunity. And impunity exists everywhere. In the United States, after Nixon's demise, Jerry Ford was made president because he was the vice president. One of the first few things Jerry Ford did was to uh, pardon Nixon for crimes committed, being committed, and to be committed. So he covered the whole gamut. So Nixon was sent scot-free. Point I have is, since the discussion here is about institution building governance and compliance, uh, I would like for the prosecutor to explore, even conceptually, if not otherwise, the links, the interactions between politics and the law. And I give you the fact that we have in jail in Curitiba right now a notorious former uh, head of the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil. He is uh, uh, in jail at the moment. Uh, supposedly, evidence is uh, overwhelming, keeping him there. On the other hand, we have a former president, uh, uh, and I suppose there are overwhelming evidence about him, too, who is scot free. Now, the question is why? You may not be able to get into the details for obvious reasons, but conceptually, at least, please explain to me and to the audience why, in one case, you had someone, former po politician, in jail based on evidence, and on the other hand, you have the most popular politician in the country, scot free and apparently with mounting evidence uh, to, the, to the opposite. Uh, so, if you could explain to me and to the audience, why is this the situation? Is, not, is there not enough evidence to put the former president in jail, as opposed to the former head of the Chamber of Deputies? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I can certainly, I'm sorry, but I can certainly not discuss the specificities of the cases, but I can, let's say, on a more general uh, observation. Uh, let me just explain first that what, what, what leads people to prison to a pre-trial detention is not only the strength of the evidence, but we need to have other evidence uh, that support the need for him to be put in jail before uh, being trialed. So this is, the, this is what we look when there is a pre-trial detention. We need to look whether there is evidence and whether there is, for example, a risk of uh, trying to obstruct investigations or a risk of escape or a risk of continuing committing crimes. So this is what uh, we usually analyze. Now, your, your question uh, allows me to make an observation about, uh, about the, the car wash case and its consequences for politics, if you, if you allow me. Um, so we are, we are in, in the middle of several crises in Brazil. There is a political crisis, of course, there is an economic crisis, and there is an ethical crisis that surrounds the country. And we come as an investigation that is actually a technical investigation. And, and we are, let's say, we are uh, used 
the evidence that we produce, the information that comes out of the investigation is used by both sides of the political spectrum to throw, si throw stones at the other side. So uh, whatever the, this investigation does, uh, it can be used by one of the sides of the polit political disputes to uh, throw stones at the other side. So if we arrest someone, we may be deemed as biased. If we don't arrest, we may be deemed as biased. If we do, if we do not, uh, all of this, the do and the don't, both have political consequences. So given that to do has a political consequence, to not do also has a political consequence, uh, we've, we really have no choice. We have to do our job. This is, how, this is what the job uh, tells us to do. It's to investigate and find out where crimes were committed and then prosecute them. It's not that we have discretion over that. We don't have discretion over that. So, uh, so the fact is that we cannot really be responsible for the political consequences of the investigation. And we, what we hope is that, going, coming further to, coming uh, beforehand to your first part of the question, what we hope is that all of this uh, and the engagement of the population on these anti-corruption efforts can help change that situation where you mentioned that, uh, uh, in conclusion, that uh, co corruption is cultural in Brazil and comes from uh, the Portuguese coming here. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to blame the Portuguese for all of that because we are an adult nation and should be more responsible for our affairs. But the point that I would like you to comment is, to what extent do you factor in political considerations in your uh, legal decisions. In one case, you locked up, locked out, up, uh, you know, the former head of the Chamber of Deputies. In the other case, you did not. Was this was political considerations uh, an element of your decision-making process in this specific case? No, we we cannot do that. Uh, we we cannot take into consideration political consequences. Now. Uh, I, would be, I would be blind to if I said that uh, we are unaware of the situation of the country, of the disputes in the country. Of course, we are aware of that, but at the most part, we really try to act uh, according to our uh, law. That's what we have to do. So we, we, I cannot say that we take political consequences into account. We don't. However, we are not blind to the effects of the, of the operation as a whole, not only to politics, but to the, economy, the economy of the country and other considerations that we have to imply. But we are, we are, we are still following the law. So another question, yeah, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear I me? think it's the last question because we have the schedule to follow. So yeah, please. Yeah, so good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Paulo Roberto, for being here today. Your presentation was perfect and brilliant. Doesn't even leave any questions, more to speak. But I feel like, uh, just for the audience, I'm a Brazilian. I lived in New York for 15 years. But I deeply, greatly care about what's going on in Brazil. Even though I live here, my kids go to school here. So you could say I could not care, but I couldn't care more than what I care. So what I saw yesterday at Dr. Moro's presentation, and even today here, to me it's an absurd, you know, everybody that I saw speaking up or pronouncing themselves were kind of not supporting this operation. To me, honestly, this is almost like a joke. You know, I'm all for democracy. We had dictatorship in Brazil, so I know what that is as well. I'm all for democracy, but I'm so sad that all the people who are sitting in here that they had left, because I would have welcomed all of them to Google tonight poverty in Brazil and see all the pictures that they would see and then listen to our prosecutors saying at least for now $60 billion were stolen for the population. I would like to see what they think it's better, where their money had gone for. You know, so can you, can no you raise the, the, the question? Like. I, I will raise the question. Okay, thank you. you. Know, so I would invite, even better, if anybody could go to Brazil and visit our favelas, that would be wonderful to see if Brazil does not need, can we just afford not to use $60 billion 
for the population in Brazil. The question, please. I will ask the I'm question. So, <laughs> so yeah. this is very important because everybody has a chance to talk. We need to have a chance to talk as well. I need to say to you how much we, 99.9% of Brazilians, support this operation. This is the best thing that ever happened to Brazil. You see, I'm a Brazilian. I had to just listen today that, oh, your country has this culture of corruption. And you know what? That used to be true until very recently. I'm 48 years old. For 45 years, we lived in a Brazil. The question, please. I will I'm, ask the I'm question. sorry. I know but that you, you can express. Important. You guys need to know, you know, we, we just mentioned already, how many people are in jail today in Brazil that was unthinkable of until three years ago? You know, big government people, big uh, executive people from other branch, they're all in jail because of this operation. So, me and almost everybody that I know so completely the question, supports the question. that. So my question is, yes. prosecutor, how proud are you to be making such a wonderful job for Brazil? You know. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much for your insights and your question. Um, uh, we are prosecutors doing our job, and we actually want. Uh, other prosecutors all around Brazil to be able to do the same job. So that's, that's the goal. That's what would make us happy. I am very proud of you. Very proud. Thank you very much. So now we are moving forward. So I want to thank Paulo Roberto Galvão and invite Sidney Nakarodo to open the other, so professor for Colombia, to open the other discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Again, huh? Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to ask if we want to get seated, and we're starting from Putin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sidney Nakahuru. I'm a member of faculty of Columbia University, School of International and Public Affairs, and will serve as the moderator for today's discussion. I'd like to thank the New School for generously hosting us for this open debate. Before starting our discussion, let me introduce our distinguished panel members. We have Matthew Taylor from American University, a specialist on corruption and um, legislative affairs. We have Paula Goons, professor at Columbia University, also a specialist in academic on corruption issues. We have Professor Ernesto Calvo, 
Among other things, he's a specialist on elections and social media, a very hot topic these days. And uh, to finalize, we have uh, Dr. Daniel Kaufman. He's the head of the Natural Resource Governance Institute, and previously he was director of the World Bank Institute as well. The title of our session is Challenges to Dismantle Chronic Capitalism, Strengthen Institutions to Tackle Corruption and Foster Development. And while the car wash operation in Brazil will provide the background for our conversation, the topic could not be more appropriate, given the times we live in Latin America and beyond. The Financial Times defines chronic capitalism as an often inefficient and corrupt system of businesses in which family and friends are favored for government or company contracts, even if better candidates are available. In 2014, The Economist created the Crony Capitalism Index, where Brazil currently places 15 among 20 other countries, just ahead of the United States and right behind Britain. The car wash operation is superlative in many ways. The magnitude of the bribes, the impact across the Latin American region, and the actors involved. For instance, Odebrecht, Brazil and Latin America's largest construction firm, agreed on paying at least $3.5 billion, the largest penalty ever, ever in a foreign bribery case Accord, according to the Department of Justice here in the United States. Peru recently blocked Odebrecht from operating in the country, which included the construction of a $7 billion uh, gas pipeline. In this operation, a Brazilian president has been impeached, a House Speaker lost his mandate, as in the jail, a senator has been imprison imprisoned, as well a former governor of Brazil and a former governor, and Brazil's once richest man, uh, executives from Petrobras and CEOs of some of the most powerful corporations were also arrested. To start discussion, I would like to ask uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew, could you please uh, elaborate on the, on the underpinnings of the corruption, uh, corruption scandal in Brazil? What do you see the main elements Of this, this, of this corruption scandal, and to what extent this, uh, you can put this in a theoretical framework? Sure, well, thank you, uh, and thank you for, for having us here. I, I think that um, it, given how partisan and politicized things have become, it's useful to take a step back and remember that a lot of what we're seeing in Lava Jato really represents the crumbling of three pillars of the economic political economy, let's say, of Brazil since democracy. And so if you think about the three pillars, the first pillar is state capitalism. The second pillar is what has been called coalitional presidentialism, and I think uh, Prosecutor Galvão talked a little bit about that. And the third is um, widespread impunity and judicial impunity. And so I think uh, to a certain degree, Lava Jato comes in and it destabilizes all three of those pillars that had been present in uh, Brazilian politics since the return to democracy in 1985. Uh, this is a phenomena that, as, I'm, as I've said, is not a particularly partisan phenomena because it's, it's deeply systemic. It's going to the connections between how coalitions are formed, um, the, the role of state-owned companies, state-owned enterprises, and then also changing the previous equilibrium, which had been judicial impunity. Uh, whether it's here to stay, I think, is the, is the big question that uh, is still an open question. And Paul, in your views, uh, what's the relationship between crony capitalism, which is the main topic of our discussion, and corruption, and how does it illustrate it in Brazil's case? Well, um I've actually done a study about that, and it was in Mexico where we found that it's, it, it tends to be the poor um, and those who are perceived with darker skin who are more affected by day-to-day -day corruption. And what ends up happening is, or what we demonstrate, is not new to anyone who has been to Latin America, is the, the elite tend to enjoy that impunity that Matthew was discussing. So what I uh, find 
particularly striking about the, the Petrobras scandal is, in fact, that you have some of the very powerful in that country uh, actually landing in jail and having to pay major fines. That is impressive from a regional standpoint, and at least that's what I would highlight. Thank you. And uh, do you think that lessons from this experience in Brazil are being, are being watched carefully in other countries of the region? Do you think that uh, to what extent what we're seeing in Brazil could, be, uh, could, could impact uh, other political systems? So it's not the first time in the region that the judiciary branch um, gives a country uh, the, the chance of, of reducing systemic corruption or reaching a new equilibrium of lower corruption. Uh, we saw Costa Rica has a history where, where actually the, the indep judicial independence also improved uh, the system and helped reduce corruption. Uh, now, again, as, you were, as we've noted, the Petrobras scandal has implications for a lot of countries around the region. It, um, in, Petru, in Peru, it's, it's a major issue right now. Uh, it's in Panama, in Mexico, etc. It, it'll be interesting to see how each one of these countries react. Uh, it'd be an interesting case study because it's the same sort of corruption. And then the question is, how do these countries' institutions respond? Uh, the hope would be that they would show the institutional strength that Brazil is showing right now vis-a-vis -vis the Petrobras scandal and, and, um, and go against the, the corrupt. And just for additional uh, background, uh, this is not the first time a state-owned oil company is used for political purposes. Uh, you have the case of Pemex Gate in Mexico in 2000. Now, the reach of the investigations were, were not nearly as profound as the ones we have here with the Lava Jato case. So again, just a little, a little bit more context. Thank you. And Ernesto, so one of the, the main reasons why Lava Jato has been a very successful operation is it is because of popular support. Right? Popular support has been a key issue, and uh, even uh, uh, Sergio Moro has acknowledged the fact that the one of the reasons why Lava Jato uh, didn't die or hasn't died, it is because uh, there's, there's, uh, there has been support and, uh, from the population. One of the reasons, perhaps, that, that has happened, it is because social media, right? It is because uh, there's the, these new technologies have allowed uh, this discontent with current political system to be voiced. Could you comment on, based on your experience and your academic research, uh, to what extent social media has played a role? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, the role of social media in the Lava Jato has been very impressive, but we also have to understand that things line up in a very particular way. So at the, at the peak of the Lava Jato, there's two things that are going on, and, and, and we saw some of that here. One is a partisan component. So when the students come here and sit, they're not really saying, you know, we're fa we favor corruption. So the attack is on the, um, on the impeachment of Dilma. And that's because in the Lava Jato you have the lineup of both partisanship going against the incumbent and the processes against prosecution. When you see social media, you see a huge explosion that is, is speaking on that. And, and the top actor, the top group of actors that are uh, uh, leading the note, the leading notes of the social media are, for example, Beja, are journalists that are very much on the right. The interesting thing that has happened now is that there's a disalignment, and that's why we're also seeing the loss of steam of the Lava Jato. What we're seeing is that this convergence between the anti-corruption and the right against the incumbent that was the PT has given way to a three-way partition that has on the one hand the new incumbent, the right has disengaged, and the Lava Jato is losing steam. So social media was critical not just because it represented the people, because in fact I wouldn't call Beja the people, and that's why we also had the student here. Lava Jato was, was critical because it actually lined up partisanship with a case against an incumbent, and now we see that being broken, and that was social media and the case are losing steam. But, uh, there's also another side, right? So social media allows people to express their uh, discontent, but also leads to polarization. Do we think that that's good for democracy? Indeed, it, it does, uh, significantly. I mean, we've been doing a lot of experiments and we are finding that uh, when people are exposed to tweets where they see the candidates, it uh, becomes more extreme. So we were, for example, exposing uh, people to tweets by Trump criticizing Hillary and Hillary criticizing Trump. 
And when we ask where Hillary and Trump are, those that were exposed to tweets, they see them way far apart, much more to the left than to the right. So we, we know that the type of information that is provided by tweets uh, produces this sort of polarization. But it's also true that when you have things like Ni Una Menos in Argentina, or you have things where uh, people are, you know, communities of activists are, are concentrated, uh, it produces the opposite effect. So in order for this sort of polarization, the type of communication that is being produced has to, uh, you know, had to rattle. And, and that's very particular about what's going on in Brazil. And Daniel, you've been working for a long time on issues related to corruption, in particular with indicators of corruption, right? I think there's the perception among the public um, opinion that corruption has increased. At the same time, like maybe corruption is, has, this perception existed because of the visibility of corruption. So could you comment on uh, what we're seeing in Brazil in terms of uh, how things have evolved over time and if you think that the country is more corrupt now than it used to be before? And first, a, a, a broader comment because you mentioned one very important dimension of this corruption, which is the label of this conference, which is chronic capitalism. And I like, I like to challenge that as, as being too tame, because what we're talking about here, and that's the perspective we have been studying it, and it's not just about Brazil, but many countries in Latin America, this, the risk, very frankly, in the US of that, is a much more a potent a, issue which, for full disclosure, we've been working for a long time, and it started with my work in Russia with some colleagues, and that's the notion of state capture, of capture of the rules of the game, of the state institutions, of the regulatory, policy, and legal framework through these vested interests in the elite. Chronic capitalism is too tame because it basically talks about what you said on the about the Financial Times, um, which is how those in the elite which are closer to power can benefit more from each other given that closeness as compared to the rest of the population. But you are talking about the perversion of the institution of the state through this, this undue influence which is in, it, in its extreme form is, is captured. So that's one very important dimension that is distinct from chronic capitalism, it's more potent, it's distinct from just grand corruption that I think we, we need this, to see this framework in the context of the, of the car wash scandal um, of all this network that uh, coalesced. In terms of the following over time the, the data, we have to be careful because some is subjective, some is perception, some is harder. That's why it's so important to triangulate and collect all the data points that are, are possible from around the world, which is what we have done. In brief, what we uh, see in, in Brazil is that there were times uh, <coughs> about a decade ago, 15 years ago, where corruption um, was not significantly less, but it was less than it has been in recent years. Um, it, in our indicators, which collect data from around the world, Brazil used to be in the top half of the world, about in the 80s out of 210 countries. And now it's in the 120s or so. So it's non-trivial that you drop from the top half to the bottom half. That's a sobering picture. The, the hopeful picture is what we witnessed in the previous lecture and in the previous day, is that there's been an un unprecedented improvement over the past decades or so in terms of the rule of law indicators. And that's very clear in the data. In fact, it is to some extent a puzzle but that we can discuss <coughs> broader why is that, that in terms of rule of law, there has been a significant problem, almost in reverse, from being in the 120s ranked out of 200 in the world to about 80 or so. And that's because of what has been uh, discussed al already here. And that's in reverse of what we see in the Mexicos and some other countries, even uh, here. Thank you. So, Matthew, going back to the main topic of our discussion, like how to dismantle chronic capitalism. With the Temer administration, one of the, the things that we, we see as part of his priority is development of market economy, right? So when you mentioned one of the, probably one of the challenges that we, that are related to, to chronic capitalism was uh, the presence of a strong 
state-owned enterprises. Do you see uh, this new uh, political environment being more uh, conducive to uh, a weakening of current capitalism that has been so pervasive in Brazil? Uh, that's a big trick question you're asking, I think. Um, I, I question some of the assumptions of the question. Um, I'm not sure that Temer is doing much more than just fixing the fiscal situation. Um, and in fact, if you look at state capitalism in Brazil, I mean, even during the deepest periods of quote unquote neoliberal reform, Brazil didn't do the kind of reform that Chile, for example, did. And, and we can argue about what's positive here and what's negative, but my point is that state capitalism in Brazil remains very important. What we've seen is a fiscal tightening that uh, has made, for example, Petrobras uh, desperate for investment and, and so forth. But I, I guess I would turn our attention away from that because I suspect that Brazil will never be the kind of open market economy that Chile strives to be, whether it achieves it or not. Uh, but I think the more important process, and this goes to, to Daniel's point, um, is what's been happening with institutions in a very slow and incremental way over the past 30 years with the multiplication of institutions of accountability in Brazil um, and the creation of multiple oversight bodies. Uh, and there are some really big historical ironies here, right? I mean, the PT, for example, invested very heavily in the federal police. They created, uh, on the basis of a framework that had been created by the Cardozo administration, they created the, the CGU, the Comptroller's General's Office. Um, there's been an accumulation, sort of a steady accumulation of new laws, of new procedures, of new staff. If you look at budgets, they've been increasing for accountability agencies. And so I think this all contributes to what Daniel described. But um, I think uh, Galvão's presentation really sets out for us the big open question is, to what extent are those institutions stronger than the individuals within them? And you know, I think that the emphasis that's been given to Moro is kind of proof of the problem in Brazil, that, that the agents are still seen as more important than the institutions themselves. The death of Zavascki, a tragedy, because, again, here, it proved that if you remove some key individuals, all of the institutional advances that we've seen may prove to be nothing more than perhaps, uh, you know, passing fad, so. I'm pretty good. And just a follow-up uh, comment on this. Uh, I agree overall with the idea that uh, Brazil remains a, a country where state capitalism is still very strong, right? but especially in the case of governance of Petrobras, for instance, we've seen a reverse in some of the orientation related to uh, industrial policy. Sure. Right? I, I think you're right, but I think, you know, another irony, and I keep pulling up ironies, but I think whoever succeeds Temer in 2018 is going to be governing a political system that looks a lot like the system that Dilma Rousseff was governing under. It's going to have a lot of the same politicians who were involved in Lava Jato, they're still going to be in the political system. Um, th the chances of the Supreme Court, at the rate that the Supreme Court moves, the very glacial pace of the Supreme Court, the chances of the Supreme Court actually getting rid of some of these dirty politicians before 2018, nil, zero. Uh, Paul, would you agree that uh, the pace has been um, slower than everyone would expect? Uh, or when you see across the region, like, it seems that uh, Brazil has been seen as, a, as doing actions that, are at, that might be reverberate uh, across other countries, right? And I remember that I'm um, talking to someone who spoke with a high official in the Mexican government, and he said they, are very, they were very jealous of Brazil because Brazil has been able to implement things that they would, would like to do in their own country. So if, if you would mind wouldn't mind providing this comparative perspective as well. Sure. So um, let me call in the case of Peru as an example. In the past few years, the CEDU counterpart, the Contraloría General de la República, has initiated some 7,000 cases. And the judiciary in Peru has only taken up 100 or so, a few hundred basically. So there's a major gap in law enforcement. Now, there may be cases where the, the Comptroller General did not initiate the cases properly, so that may explain some of it, but there is really a, a problem with uh, 
with the judiciary in Peru. And then you look at what's happening in Brazil, beginning with Mensalao, and it's impressive. Uh, now that is for somebody who may read uh, beyond the headlines. I think sometimes when people see what's happening in Brazil in just the headlines, the impression is chaos, drama. It's a, it's a corruption paradox, so it's a, or, or um, a prosecution paradox. The more you attack the problem, the more attention you might be drawing to it. And so uh, those who read beyond those headlines, I think you might find reason for hope, because in attacking it, you actually may, if you attack it properly, you may lead to, to future improvement. That's the hope, again. Pretty good. And uh, a question for Ernesto. So, Ernesto, you're among other areas of expertise. Uh, can you hear guys in the back, or is it there's too much background noise? Okay. So, uh, I'm talking about Argentina, right? Argentina is going through a process of um, uh, changes as well. So, do you see, and since we are addressing uh, uh, making comparisons with other countries, what parallels do you see between what's going on in Argentina and to what extent, uh, in the context of cronyism, right? Uh, there are lessons to be learned from Argentina in Brazil's case. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Argentina has already benefited to some extent. I don't know if some people have been following, but um, with the other bridge case, now we have uh, uh, the chief of the intelligence in Argentina, equivalent to the CIA from Argentina, Arriba, is now being implicated uh, uh, as receiving a significant amount of money from the company. Uh, uh, so that's having uh, ripples in Argentina are interesting. In Argentina, we had a very similar dynamics in Brazil because the current administration made a campaign very aggressively on the issue of corruption, attacking Cristina uh, Cristina Fernandez, um, and uh, very successfully gathering steam through social media, including uh, social media uh, that rose uh, exponentially with the Nisman case that some people might be aware. Now, right after the government took office, they started to be implicated in this, the Panama Papers, the Odebrecht case. So uh, they're starting to face this sort of same pressure. And we're seeing the same sort of loose of steam on social support, where you have this fragmentation. So um, in the recent crisis uh, with the tarifas, with the rise of the rates, uh, the government tried to use anti-corruption uh, messages in social media and the news so that they would gather uh, opposition to Christina Kirchner and justify the recent tariffs. But interestingly enough, supporters didn't actually took that. Uh, now, the, the bad side, to put it that way, is that what we see is that the uh, previous administration considers the anti-corruption message as a message that was done for political reasons. And the new administration cannot take the issue of corruption because it perceives that issue as you know, not being uh, honest and the government as being disingenuous in how it is presented. So we see the same sort of break that we're seeing in Brazil where one part thinks that it was done to hurt the incumbent and the other part thinks that we should now you know, scale back because this is no longer good for us. And the people that are remaining in the anti-corruption uh, proper tend to be shrinking radically. And in a sense, I think what we're seeing is that the, the courts, the legal system, um, is progressively becoming weaker, weaker politically, not you know, in terms of the cases. So I think the Argentine case is a, a, skull, uh, you know, a scale version of similar forces. Thank you. And Daniel. So, some of the largest sources of bribe in car wash operation involves uh, Petrobras. And uh, is that a sign that Brazil might be a victim of the resource curse? Because this is something that probably connects with your current position as the head of the Natural Resource Governance Institute. Uh, you know, the, the, the famous joke of the bank robber was asked, why do you rob a bank? And he says, or she says, that's because where the money is, that's where the money is. Well, in, in countries where are resource rich, uh, they are indeed, we're talking before about capture, there's such an easy and <laughs> ready to be picked capture in terms of the institutions which control what, what could be more rich than oil. So in some countries, that would be the state-owned enterprise, which tend to be mammoth, huge, and not necessarily very efficient. In others, it could be the private sector. There are serious questions 
and you have seen it all over the media, what's happening in this country over the past few weeks regarding Exxon, including what happened just a few days ago, that because of the lobbying of Exxon <coughs> and in cahoots with, with Congress, it just repealed an anti-corruption uh, rule and pro-transparency rule. So it doesn't always have to focus on the state and the press. It depends on the context and on the country. Uh, the resource course is the common, uh, the common notion about countries that are very rich in natural resources, and because of those riches, if it doesn't have the proper governance in terms of the main institutions, they will be subject to capture, and that has been relatively common. But there's absolutely nothing deterministic that it has to happen that way. That resource course is man-made, and unfortunately, but so are countries that escape it or avoid it. And of course I'm biased because I'm from Chile, but you mentioned Chile before. Chile to a large extent has managed to avoid that. We have other challenges, including some corruption scandals, but that has been avoided. So we, having one of the most efficient state-owned enterprises in the world, which is a copper, the largest co uh, copper company in the world, which is Codelco. So yes, it can be done. There's nothing predetermined that just because it's the state-owned enterprise, it has to be either a disaster or totally corrupt. But it has to completely refor reform uh, itself, and obviously it has those challenges. PDVSA in Venezuela, there are other examples in Ecuador and all over uh, other countries in, in uh, Africa and, and so on. So yes, it can, it, it can be addressed, and it's nothing very deterministic about it, but it has to, the rules of the game have to completely change for those type of organizations. Okay, so one of the most negative sides of uh, the cronism, uh, crony capitalism is rent seeking. Right? And an economist uses a very interesting analogy, right? And they describe cron uh, rent seeking as instead of businesses looking to grow a pie, uh, they are looking for a, a bigger slice of the, the pie of the same size. Right? And I would like to ask this question, and uh, it's an open question for the panelists. What can be done in order to reduce rent-seeking opportunities in Brazil? Well, um, I think in my, my previous answer, I, ho I hope I didn't leave the impression of being overly pessimistic because I think that there, well, I, I think Brazil is sort of at a tipping point. Um, if you look at any number of indicators, for example, in my work I've looked at the number of fines uh, if you look at the number of civil servants who have been fired for malfeasance, if you look at the number of prosecutions of corruption, if you look at the number of convictions of corruption, even though they started at a very low uh, level in the 1980s, over the past 30 years, there's been sort of an exponential increase um, in any number of these indicators. And, you know, that, that's not always an unalloyed, positive, good thing. We've heard some questions about you know, perhaps politicians are becoming overly constrained. I, I don't share those worries, but I think that they are good ones to have in mind. Um, but I also think, uh, so, so I, I guess the, the point is, there, has been, there have been many important, very positive gains. They've been incremental. They've been going on for 30 years. And I think we finally hit critical mass uh, in the mental loan, uh, although I, you know, the effects there were pretty minor. Um, and now in, in Lava Jato, um, and I think there's also one other thing that hasn't been mentioned and, and is worth mentioning, and I don't mean in any way to suggest that it's the most important thing by a long shot, but I think it's important for us to keep in mind international cooperation. Um, Prosecutor Galvão mentioned cooperation with Switzerland, which even as recently as 2000 was not happening. Um, the, the extraterritorial enforcement of FCPA uh, by the United States, at some point is going to become a problem. Um, you know, I think if I were a Brazilian or a Chilean, uh, I might say, why are they prosecuting our companies and not their own? Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, the net is getting tighter. And whether it continues to tighten is an open question, especially under the current administration. But extraterritorial enforcement, I think, gives added teeth and added credibility to domestic enforcement. And so what we saw with Lava Jato is, as, as you mentioned, Sydney, you know, th this is the largest anti-corruption settlement 
in world history. This is huge. Uh, and I think that um, it, it does give an extra, you know, it puts wind in the sails of the Lava Jato team uh, to have the support of these foreign prosecutors um, and fairly incontrovertible evidence of what, what has been going on in Brazil that they've been alleging has been going on, but then to have the added wind in their sails of foreign prosecutors saying the same thing. So um, the way I heard your, your, your question, Sydney, is sort of what to do moving forward, what's the long-term solution. Um, I want to also pick up on, on Matthew's point about FCPA enforcement because uh, there, you may remember this major oil spill in the Gulf, and the Gulf is not just... Uh, not just the United States, it's shared with other countries. And as far as I know, and I, I would, I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, Mexico got nothing uh, from, from uh, reparations from that spill. And so there's something, and com contrast that to what's going on right now with the Petrobras scandal, where Brazil's going to get 80% of the $3.5 billion um, that, that have been uh, won in the, or agreed upon in the settlement. So contrast that and correct me if I'm wrong on the, on the oil spill. But moving forward, um, uh, one of the questions I thought very appropriate with regards to the 10 measures, um, you know, it's more than 10 measures. Maybe that one can question that it was not uh, uh, created by a civil society organization and whatnot. But the fact is, moving forward, you can't just rely on prosecutors and judges to contain corruption and move toward a lower corruption equilibrium. You do need structural reforms. I think there's plenty in the 10 measures that are, that are worthwhile. Uh, you know, uh, uh, ensuring confidentiality of whistleblowers when triggering an investigation, extending the statute of limitations, uh, enhance asset confiscation capabilities, reduce the, the reliance on, on, on a court of appeals. All those are good things, and I think Brazilians should really maintain this mobilization, this social activism, and push for structural reforms. Maybe the 10 measures are a good starting point, and looking beyond those to other things like um, how do you reduce this reliance on coalitions that then require payments of different sorts to maintain those coalitions? Um, well, I think we have a good beginning. <laughs> Uh, in Brazil, so the question is to what extent the political system is still going to have the incentives to push in the same direction and to what extent uh, the judiciary can uh, increase legitimacy as being a, a non-partisan independent source of uh, prosecution of this kind of crime. So, and, and that does require investing in political capital to make the judiciary independent. On the other hand, Democracies, I think, get better because winners lose election. No, that's Shewarski. So the, when I put a restaurant, the first year is going to go in a loss. The second year starts to pair up. The third year is even. And then I start to get a profit. And you can think of rent seeking in the same way. It is not something that you, you know, jump in and start to profit immediately. You need to build networks. You need to be, uh, build channels. So um, democratic competition and alternation disrupt a lot of those mechanisms. It's not, a, I think, a coincidence that as um, time goes by, in comments become more brazen, amounts increase, and the uh, resources flow more readily because you spend a lot of time in the beginning producing those channels, creating those. So it's not just creating a stronger judiciary that is important and to make sure that those are nonpartisan, but it's also uh, ensuring that you have an alternation that disrupts the capacity of incumbents of drain resources and, and those, I think that uh, it is not uncommon for opposition parties to be the ones that are leading uh, these sort of charges because those are not the ones that benefit. So um, those tend to produce commitment on their own voters not to do the same thing. They, they promise things that sometimes they have to abide with. So those are dynamics that I think in, in democracies in Latin America we've seen and they've been good. That is clearly one that is more successful, more extensive, larger. But I think we've seen similar things at a smaller scale in other of the countries of Latin America. Uh, can I be very frank, Sydney? This, this notion of rent seeking that you bring up, do um, you know why it exists? It's because we were chicken. Why were we chicken? I, I'm an economist. I used to be for a long time at the World Bank. In the World Bank, and this is 1980s, early 90s, 
we were not allowed to write in official documents the word corruption. So rent-seeking, and also in, in general, more academically, people were too afraid of writing the, spell it out. So we started with rent-seeking because we're not allowed, and then we had to be creative and write C dot 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 dot. Just get closer. Until the mid-90s, a new president comes, we understood that, and we worked really hard, and we started for the first time the anti-corruption uh, practice. So let us means no words. We're talking about corruption. We're talking about capture. We're talking about chronic capitalism and economies for the longest time, and there is a lot in the literature still from the old days, rent-seeking, but let's call it by its name. Just to complement what our colleagues just said, which, with which we agree, very good points, in addition to rule of law, which obviously is critical, has been discussed, let me suggest the absolute paramount importance of voice and accountability mechanism to give, to have the space for civil society to make governments accountable. We're taking it for granted in some sense because in, that's something that is very vibrant in Brazil. By no means it should be taken for granted for the world in general, where major closing of civic space is taking place, or even in our continent, Latin America, where there are real clouds in the horizon in some other, other countries. Next, transparency. <laughs> sunlight being the best disinfectant. It's absolutely crucial. We are not going to go through the details now, but essentially creating, out of this voice and accountability, millions and millions of auditors replacing basically the, the, the trust that has to be conferred on just having the judiciary or just having the supreme audit institutions, and whether it's 50 or 200 people cannot do that job, even if they're uh, fully in, of integrity. Meritocracy at all levels, whether it's about Petrobras, whether it's about the public service, and so on, is absolutely critical. Political reform, of course, campaign finance reform is crucial. That has been happening in Latin America. That's a good sign, but it's often partial, still full of loopholes. It's unfinished agenda, still pending. And I know in Brazil there's been some progress, but more needs to be done. Last but not least, within political reform, and insufficiently emphasized, is the need for political party reform. Political parties, even in, in democracies that have been around, like ours in Chile for a while, Brazil and others, political parties themselves are non-democratic. And how the leaders are elected, the members that are allowed to elect leaders. As a result, there are a lot of not too young males, for instance. And, uh, and the new generation is not allowed to come in. We do have that very serious problem in my own country, in, in, in Chile. And Daniel, you mentioned that uh, we cannot take things for granted, and I think history has shown a lot of examples. In the, in the context of the car wash operation, like the, the case of Italy is um, always mentioned. Right? The fact that uh, what came after, the, the clean hands, uh, was, I think, the ultimate uh, example of um, chronic capitalism with, the, uh, with Berlusconi. So another open question for the, for the panelists. To what extent we, first, we can address challenges uh, and, and, and deal with the, with the risks that something like what happened in Italy might happen in the case of Brazil, and in which ways uh, you guys already have started uh, making recommendations, policy recommendations. Uh, but I would like to ask you in, in terms of a sequencing, like what should be prioritized uh, in the short, medium, and longer run? Reform in Brazil is always incremental because there are so many veto players. And so, you know, we might want the 10 measures that the Ministerio Público has suggested. Um, it won't happen, and, and um, you know this is this is bad on the one hand, but it's also I think uh, part of being a big federal country with a very complex multi-party system and so forth. Um, it, we might want political reform that limits the number of parties, um, but again, here it's very hard to do, especially when it's the incumbents themselves who have to do it. Um, I think, though, that um, Brazil has gone through a very interesting process of policy learning. Um, and one of the most interesting things that's happened in the accountability arena in Brazil has been the degree to which the accountability bureaucracies dialogue with each other 
Uh, they meet with each other, or they used to, I'm not sure if they still are under the Temer government, but certainly under both the Cardozo and the PT governments, uh, these agencies would meet together in the so-called ENCLA process at the federal level. Um, uh, this is the national strategy for anti-money laundering and anti-corruption. Um, you, it's at the height of this, you had 70 different agencies talking together about how they could change uh, the law, how they could change procedures, how they could cooperate, and I think that this is essential. Um, are there some places where there might be better than incremental gains? Uh, the one that, that I think is most, uh, that could be the most fruitful, the one that is most likely to lead to political change, uh, and the one that could be pushed through with perhaps the least resistance, uh, and that's not saying much, but um, it could be with least resistance, is the elimination of the so-called foro privilegiado, the, the privileged standing in the high court for sitting politicians. The foro privilegiado, uh, it, just for those of you who, who don't know, has been used, it's been applied about 300 times since the return to democracy. Of those 300 times that it's been used, four have led to convictions. Uh, about a third of the cases are prescribed. They've run out the statute of limitations by the time they reach a decision. And so it's, a, it's just a, it's a huge sort of impunity bottleneck. Um, and uh, I think it's one of those things that there has been increasing effort to try to change it. It is not procedural like the Ministerio Público's 10-point uh, initiative, but it is a case where I think eliminating it would send the sign that the rule of law applies to all and it applies to all equally. So in the short term, I'd like to highlight um, two measures passed under the uh, PT administrations that are worth definitely keeping and, and celebrating. One is the passage of the transparency law under Gilma's uh, administration. That's definitely worth keeping. Um, the two is participatory budgeting has mixed reviews, but where it's worked, it's worked very well. So I would say keep that and try to improve it, uh, especially to, to reduce local corruption and improve local participation. Uh, keep up the protests, keep up the, the public pressure. It's, it has worked. And uh, for prosecutors and judges, you know, they're supposed to prosecute and they're supposed to judge. So they should keep doing that. Uh, medium term, the 10 measures I do think is a good start, and I, I would hope that instead of the, the steam, it losing steam and losing interest, I hope it's, you know, it, it picks up again, and I, I would hope it's passed. Uh, I also think that, you know, uh, I've, I've been going back on and on about the importance of, of Brazil's independent judiciary and, and the importance of what, it, what it's gained, so protect that, and, uh, and I just have a quote that I think from the, from the uh, Italian uh, clean hands movement, uh, the, the, the head prosecutor said something I think was worth sharing with you all. So Antonio Di Pietro said, or once said, we've had center left and center right governments, and instead of trying to prevent corruption, they have all denigrated judges. Point being, it's also with the pressure from, from the public, it'd be great if legislators actually legislated reforms that would help prevent corruption or change the structure to prevent corruption into the future. So there's a, a case that I really like, Teddy Roosevelt in the road to the presidency, the way in which he became the vice president, the president was killed and he became president, was he was made chief of police. So there was a law in the books by which you can sell alcohol on the weekends and the um, police would only enforce it as the election approach to get some resources. So they would decide who would be, you know, call up and, you know, if you don't give us money for the campaign, you're not going to be able to um, open on Saturday. So Taylor Roosevelt said, you know, the law is in the book. If you don't like it, take it down. If not, I'm going to enforce it. So he went full speed, and therefore that became a huge issue, you know, a huge protest by bar owners, huge protest, because the, book, the, the law was not there to be enforced. The law was there to satisfy the people that were against alcohol being sold and then to get some resources. So when you create laws that provide this somewhat leeway, you know, forbearance, uh, allows you to recruit, you know, to get resources. So uh, in a way, Lava Jato has a, an odd effect in which it makes the benefits of getting those sideline resources more expensive. You know, the cost 
for getting the money to the right people has gone up. That means that there's you know, fewer opportunities to be corrupt if you want, but also a higher price tag for being able to control those channels. So a big question for me next is, okay, now you've been able to attack those resources and see that the cost to go up, of, you know, or the cost of doing business uh, has gone up. Can you close the other doors so that now that the benefits can be more concentrated, can be higher, and being an intermediary is actually more profitable, can you close those that are up in the coming? So the long-term you know, uh, success for me has to do with being able to shift and you know, plug those holes that open because, in a sense, you now have a business that would be more profitable if you know when to close and when to open the door. You know, maybe prosecutors can get a lot of benefits by being tough or less tough with these new resources. Um, and that's something in Argentina has been heavily discussed. Again, Sydney, I'm not going to pretend to give the priorities for Brazil. I'm, I'm not from Brazil. It reminds me of Mark Twain said, what, hundred and some years ago, when he gave the definition of an expert, like expert consultant, he said, it's somebody from out of town. Yeah, Th this notion that one arrives from outside and we know. You are experts, you are from Brazil, you will know best what are the priorities. A lot has been mentioned, has been studied, there are 10. Let's say that I agree with, with them all. Let me make just two br broader points. One is that for success of these measures, there has to be, and this is what I've learned from many countries of the world, there has to be a truly participatory process. So, uh, all the work that you have done, and it's been done in terms of social mobilization, social media, that has to be tapped also for the prioritization itself, for the buy-in from, from this movement and from the citizens, but also afterwards. There's a whole technology for monitoring all these reforms, for scorecards, and civil society, NGOs, think tanks have an incredibly important role. This is happening as we speak in Chile, where we had our two scandals, the Pentagate and the, the Cabal scandal, a la Petrobras, but much smaller. A number of friends in other countries in Latin America told me if it happened in our country, it would not have even been news. That's the strength of governance of a, uh, in a country where corruption does happen, it happens in every country. The issue is how the country responds and reacts. So now there's a monitoring and, and a scorecard, about 70% of the measures that the Commission uh, agreed, and those who have priorities done by Chile are being implemented, implemented satisfactorily, 30% not yet, and so on. So this is very important, the issue of, of social mobilization and participation in the follow-up uh, to keep the pressure. That's part of accountability. The other, the other point is about prioritization. Sometimes prioritization it can be a fig leaf for not doing enough because of the presumption that everything Every measure is incredibly institutionally resource demanding, when in fact it's just demanding in terms of political will, a lot of, of those measures, which is very important. But there are some low-hanging fruits there, and it could be part of 10 or 20. And I'll mention just one, because that one I do know about. I sit on in the international board of this transparency initiative, which is Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. 51 countries have joined the Colombias of this world, the United States, the Norways, many, many others. They're doing fantastic work, and transparency is taking place in those countries, including subjecting, subjecting the state-owned enterprises to this transparency. Brazil has shown absolutely no interest. This is the moment. What? It would not be at the expense of anything else. So let's be careful with the notion of prioritization, because sometimes it's a it's an easy excuse for not doing homework, which is a low-hanging fruit for many respects, except for politicians not wanting to do it. Pretty good. So this is a good time for us to open the floor for questions from the audience. And uh, if you could please come to the microphone, state your name, your affiliation, and ask a question, not uh, make a statement, please. Thank you very much for all the panel, panelists. Uh, my name is Dan Torrey. Um, I work in a law firm. I work with um, anti-corruption matters. And one of the things that it strikes me, both as somebody who thinks about these issues and also as a practitioner, is the difference between corruption with a capital C 
and corruption with a lower C, small C. Because laws make a, a specific political decision of what they're going to consider corruption. They give a definition for corruption. And we've been talking about corruption um, confusing, not, I, I don't mean confusing, but um, there are two types of problems. For example, the FCPA. The FCPA does not apply to intelligence officials because sometimes the, the very role of the CIA is to pay bribes abroad in order to acquire uh, information. That's the same of essentially every anti-corruption law that I've seen um, in the world. The UK Bribery Act is the same thing. Um, so similar to what happens with um, other issues, for example, um, torture, when you have um, a particular legal definition that is something is torture, but something that you might do outside of it in a moral perspective might also be torture, can also be applied to corruption. So for example, in the United States, um, nepotism or cronyism is not necessarily illegal. You can't give a public function job to somebody just because he's a cousin of yours or because he's a friend, although that's not prohibited. You could argue that it's the same kind of behavior, the same kind of motivations that underline uh, bribery, the corruption giving a financial advantage. Now, in your line of research, have you pay attention to this distinction between the corruption with a capital C, the legal definition of corruption, and corruption in a more moral, ethical level, and whether, when we are f talking about Lava Jato, are we paying attention to just one side of corruption, or whether we are actually tackling the broader um, the moral perspective that underlines um, other corruption that might not be considered illegal, but is also harmful for society? Very quickly, because 20 years ago we wrote an article precisely because of that concern which we labeled as legal corruption and we tried to define it. And it, in, at least from our approach, it's very much related to the previous discussion on, on state capture. A lot of what happens under, in, in, with the mechanism of, of capture sometimes are quite subtle are, and are either legal or extra legal and not fully illegal. Let's keep in mind that the laws of the land not only vary enormously from one land to another, but they, they can change very quickly across time. Last week, it, it was one law regarding uh, mandating the oil companies and the gas companies in terms of being transparent. Today is another, it's a different one. They don't have to, an opacity can, can rule. Only la until last year, the definition, in fact, of bribery, before it went to the Supreme Court in the Virginia governor case here in the United States, that was illegal, then it became legal. So even within one, one a jurisdiction, that can change. And why does it change? Often because of these vested interests and undue influence. So it's part of the, the same undue influence of the elite that those laws are being shaped. So it's very important not to consider just something that is strictly illegal according to the laws of the moment in a particular country as something that is corrupt when in a more global norm and in a broader sense it may be totally unethical and indeed corrupt but not according to the law of that land that very minute. Yeah, in the interest of our participation, like we will try to uh, have questions asked to one of the participants. Feel free to direct the questions or just ask generally to the panelists. Okay. I'll ask for Paul. Um, much was said uh, this today, yesterday and today about the systemic uh, uh, fact of the Lava Jato operation system that was found and, of course, the corruption in a sense in Brazil. Uh, we have seen that a lot in the in the parliament and in the executive branch, uh, but we also haven't yet seen much of a discussion inside the judiciary system. Do you think uh, the judiciary system will also be ready to reflect its, with the self and with society on changing uh, the way it works and, uh, and to build better institutions in Brazil? So I'd like to hear actually Matthew's take on it because Matthew yeah. has... has both, both, yeah. Go ahead. I can start here. Go ahead. 
Um, so I, it, it's funny you asked. I just happened to be looking at the data. Um, I think there were 6,000-ish cases um, that were brought uh, of, of questioning judges in Brazil, um, I believe since the creation of the CNJ, which is the National Judicial Council. And, um, you know, the, the CNJ doesn't have many powers that it can use to punish judges. The, the, probably the strictest is really just retirement. Um, and I think that there were 38 cases of retirement since the creation of the CNJ. So there's a lot to be done there. But I, I also think that there's a bigger question, and it doesn't just refer to Brazil. Um, but in Brazil, it, it may become an issue in the future, which is one that we haven't, we've kind of danced around in the last couple of days, but that's the accountability of the legal profession. And, um, you know, Brazil has the most independent prosecutorial service and the most independent judges. I mean, by some measures, they're, they're the most independent. In terms of budget, they're extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, the, the cost of the judiciary in Brazil is about 1.8% of GDP when you add in all of the professions, which is, you know, head and shoulders above anybody else in the Western Hemisphere. Um, a multiple of other countries in the Western Hemisphere. And, you know, that's good because it gives you independent prosecutors who are willing to do their job. On the other hand, if you go and you start to dig into some of the state prosecutorial services or you start digging into the judiciary, you do find these examples of abuses. Um, and sometimes it's not a terrible abuse. Sometimes it's just, I heard a story recently of uh, uh, a prosecutor who came and talked to me and he said, my colleague doesn't get in until 11. He goes to the gym, he comes in at 11, he has lunch, and he leaves at 2. And, you know, is that corrupt? Probably. I mean, but it's not the kind of corruption that we're thinking of. But I, I, the point I want to raise is there needs to be some sort of accountability for the functioning of the system. And there is a tension here between giving independence, which is a good thing, but also demanding the service. And again, this is not a Brazilian problem. This is a global problem. Uh, but I think it is present in Brazil in a way that, that may soon become an issue. Hi there. Uh, I have a question that's not related to corruption per se, but uh, it's to be interesting given your background. Uh, you see that in Brazil nowadays we live a big political problem that uh, most of the population, they don't feel that the politicians represent them. And we have problems with tax code, which is insane. We have problems with the labor laws that goes back to the Carta del Lavoro, the, the, the Italian fascist regime. There are so many problems. Would you recommend that do you have like a, a, a priority? We recommend like a sort of prioritization of where to tackle among all the problems we have. <laughs> yeah, somehow I think it's been addressed, but if someone, some of the panelists would like sure. to reinforce. Um, I mean, that's a difficult question. Uh, whenever you're in a deep economic crisis and we've seen the end of the left turn in Latin America to some extent is also the end of the economic boom. Um, we have uh, increasing disaffection, uh, you know, uh, what, what we're seeing in Brazil is not new. The, the rate of support for U.S. Congress in the U.S. at the peak of the crisis in 2008 uh, was uh, below 12%. Uh, Britney Spears and communism actually have better rates than Congress during the crisis in the U.S. Um, so what's the best solution? Growth makes the situation of people better, but that's not you know, a process to be undertaken. We've seen that when the economy starts to grow, valence ratings for politicians go up dramatically. You know, just as Dilma uh, won the second, uh, you know, won re-election by, by massive margins and party identification with PT a few years ago was through the roof. So um, what we're seeing is something systemic from democracy in Brazil, I don't think so. I think that democracy in Brazil, it is a well-established game uh, and as is in the U.S. and as is seen today in Argentina, and the unhappiness that we're seeing uh, is um, uh, poor performance at all levels. Uh, that oftentimes ends up dynamizing things like, for example, the job review and processes in which uh, politicians need to provide better responses, and the system works, I think, sometimes better. They implement ten things; eight of those are crap. 
so the next government take care and eliminate those aids and propose to new things, but things that are relatively good remain, like for example, you know, plea bargains. So you start to see that those things are, are start to improve. So are, are voters in Brazil disaffected? Absolutely. Are voters in the U.S. disaffected? That's Trump. Uh, so yeah, it happens. What's the solution to that? You know, do better. But I don't think that that's a, a structural reform plan. And so I, I don't have much to recommend. So I'll just, uh, at risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to go back to the 10 measures uh, proposed, I think, in March of last year. Uh, then we, as we know, in the legislature, at a very uh, tragic moment, you know, they tried to pass an amendment that weakened that law, and they tried to pass it in the d dark of night, which is telling. So I think going back to that, I, I think it would be worth, um, I'm an outsider, so it's not up to me, but I do think Brazilians should, should look into uh, seeing whether it's good for, that, for your society, and if it is, pressure to, to get it passed. I'd like to invite some of the students or members of the uh, academic community who express their dis, uh, uh, discontent with uh, the tone of the discussions that were proposed for this event to maybe take the microphone and use this opportunity uh, since it's been emphasized that, that having a participatory process is very important uh, to coming up with a solution. So this is a good opportunity for someone who'd like to maybe disagree uh, with what, what's been said so far. Once in a while we get a corrupt president, then maybe the next guy, but then there's the respect for the office, and that's usually what cleans the, uh, the field at that moment. Uh, same thing back in Puritan days, it was judges, judges, then the respect for the office. I'm just wondering in terms of the, uh, you know, the hierarchy, uh, uh, where is the, the key respect for the office that can be counted on to change perhaps a personality? We've had presidents like Arthur, who was the most corrupt guy, then he became president and he became respect of the office kind of person. Is it the judicial? Is it the parliament? Is it a governorship? Is it the president in Brazil? None of the above. Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, we have Trump as president here. So I'm, I'm a bit on a low. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, Sometimes the least qualified wins, and uh, sometimes democracy does well anyway, and not because people have that sort of respect, but because they, they take the role of the game and they allow the democratic process to go on, and they fight against things that don't quite see as uh, legitimate, like the ban. So I'm not sure that people ask for, um, I don't think, I'm not sure they have those high expectations and that high expectations always are realized. Sometimes the bad guys win. And I still, we still hear, we still organize, we still fight, we get good democracies. I'm not sure um, that the response is on, you know, getting the right person there, but making sure that the wrong one gets down. But anyway. But perhaps that's part of the problem that we, we live in a world where we have been so obsessed with a particular personality, and it becomes so personalized. In, 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 uh, in teaching a bit and giving lectures, I would do this exercise about seven, eight years ago. I would ask the students, how many of you know who the leader of Venezuela is? And everybody knew Chavez. And then I would ask, give me the name of any leader today or past 20 years of Switzerland, and not a bit I knew, nobody knew any name. Then I would ask which country is better governed, okay? Um, and then, of course, <coughs> it, it's an extreme case, but it goes to show the absolute paramount importance of what kind of institutions there is, and ultimately, whether there are checks and balances, and that's the main concern nowadays, here and, and in other countries and in, in our countries. And of course, 
part of the answer to your question, if it is about the office and which office, will be context specific. There are parliamentary systems, there are very strong presidential systems, and not so strong presidential system. so it will be, depend very much. And so it depends very much when we're talking about the United States. In the UK, it's different. In Latin America, it's, it's, it's yet different. But are we talking about this? Sorry for the quip, but I cannot escape it now. A system of checks and balances, or checks and checks. <laughs> and, and, and let me add, because linking it to a previ our previous discussion, we come back to this in absolutely paramount pillar nowadays of accountability, which is the social accountability of voice. And one interesting thing that we detect in the data over the past 10 years in Latin America is that the tolerance for impunity and for corruption has been declining. Before we were very concerned, and it was even in service and other about the indifference or about the pessimism, we cannot do anything about it, that's the way politics work. Not so anymore. And that's what we have seen in terms of social mobilization in Central America recently. As we speak over the past few days, many of you would have watched Romania. It's absolutely incredible. The question is, of course, every country has a different tipping point where those things begin to really matter, and it, it will vary significantly. But let's not underestimate as an absolute pillar, and it's in terms of that quote-unquote office question, it's going to be in the next stage in terms of the, the issue of, of social mobilization, where the new tech tools that you work on are, are ab absolutely um, critical. There is less tolerance now, nowadays than there used to be, be before. And, and people with social media and others, they know what's happening in other countries. And they learn from that, and there's much more interface. So that's, I, I, I think it's very important in these darker or more troubled, troubled times to still keep in mind that there are some very important positive developments. No, and I think this is a good point to make. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you have to conclude our session. But the fact that uh, technology has allowed us to access a number of opportunities. Unfortunately, you have to leave the auditorium in five minutes. Uh, yeah. I have a yeah. question. Can I? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, unfortunately, I, you have to a, conclude. It's a real because, question this time. No, no, no I'm the problem, Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, we okay, really have no. to conclude in five, in five minutes. Okay, yeah, these, yeah, these are the only the. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we're sorry, yeah, because this was the agreement with the uh, administration. Uh, but I was in line, you know, in this case. Yeah, but I have a question to the pair. I mean, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate you. This was a very intelligent and insightful panel. I learned a lot today. So I'm curious, I mean, from a Brazilian perspective, how do you see, like, in 10, 20 years, when we look back, how much or how much not the car wash operation will have impacted Brazilian history and culture and all of that? Yeah, I think very briefly. Yeah. So very briefly, uh, just uh, maybe look at the history of Hong Kong and how it uh, her, you know, fought corruption. It's impressive how it went from systemic corruption to a situation where it's, it's much more contained. It's not, it, it's not a guarantee, but it's much more contained. So there's hope for Brazil. I don't really have a question because I wanted just to state, since we'll be recording the, the event, that the dissonant voices you asked for and also the students before uh, expressed, uh, we are not part of the student group and we are part of another group uh, that has been very active in not just demanding, of course, the end of corruption, which everybody wants in Brazil, but also the, the end of this, this farce that has been the impeachment process or, you know, the, the, the disenfranchising of a uh, democratically elected pre president that has not been, that by now has been proven not to be guilty. Um, so I just wanted to say that we have, and we won't, won't have time for this, but we have a number of reasons why this event was also organized in a way that wasn't democratic, um, that has a, a, a release about it that ha it tries to implement the fact that um, the organizations, the institutions in Brazil are really strong and functioning, which is not true. Um, in fact, they are being dismantled by a certain number of measures that have been forced um, 
unconstitutionally. Um, they've been fight. The, the, there is a resistance of fighting for those unconstitutional measures, um, and also for the fact that other, even now with the new Supreme Justice uh, person appointed, uh, hopefully that won't stand. Alex, Alexandre de Moraes. There's a number of politicians in power right now, who, as you know, are charged of corruption, and they are. Um, being investigated, but the, the, the justice in Brazil, the justice system doesn't seem to be equal uh, for all. So that's why we were in protest yesterday at Sergio Mons. Many of you probably were there at Columbia University. Um, we have a number of reasons in this letter to the presidents of both universities of why Sergio Mons shouldn't be in an event so conflicted with this um, interests. Uh, that are being discussed in the, the other part of the seminar. We would love to distribute this to everybody in the audience, and uh, we hope that there is in the future an equal uh, measure of an event that can discuss to the same level of, um, you know, so that, that can be more open. I'm sure that an event that we help organize, or the students or other organizations, will be much more balanced, and we won't close the door to the side that uh, tried to um, legi excuse me, legitimize the, the current impeachment processes. So thank you for your words and thank you for the, you know, your understanding that there is actually for some, in some measures, some people here uh, a knowledge that there is a coup going on and uh, it's a, a cooperative, mediatic, um, and parliamentary coup going on and, and now judicial even. Um, so thank you for your time. Okay, unfortunately we have to conclude our session. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for this very insightful discussion and hand over the floor to Philip Ramos. But before that, uh, please let's give a hand of applause to our participants here. <laughs> As a, as, a, as a critique before, um, we look like the mayor's cabinet. Uh, so um, I'm going to receive an email very likely. Congratulations, you have an all male panel. Uh, so just to say. Thank okay. you. I would like just to thank you, all the panelists, all the people involved in organizing the event. Uh, we know that we are aware that the issue is very controversial. Uh, we know like this thing beforehand. But I think we appreciate this kind of debate to raise the issues. We cannot run away of these polemical issues. Uh, these issues have uh, to be discussed. And I think that the main place, the proper place to debate such issues in a very open, democratic way, in which everyone can have their voices heard, is a university that's democratic, that's open, and there is no censorship. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for all who accepted our invitation. <laughs>